Good evening. Welcome back to Voices of Hope Winter Speaker Series. My name is Lois Berkowitz, and as Voices of Hope's Assistant Secretary, I'm honored to introduce tonight's speaker. I also happen to be a child of a Holocaust survivor as well as a clinical psychologist. So I look forward to having a conversation with Ruth about her book and how inherited trauma plays a role. Ruth Rockowitz is the child of Holocaust survivors from Austria and a member of the Phoenix Holocaust Association. She holds a BA and MA in English and has taught English and writing on both the college and high school levels. Ruth's writing has been published in a number of anthologies and she served as a member of the editorial board for, um, excuse me, I lost my place here. Um, and she served uh, for the women's newspaper of Princeton. Much of Ruth's writing is informed by her understanding of the Holocaust and her experience as a child of survivors. In her book, Escaping the Whale, her first published novel, Ruth addresses the issue of inherited trauma and its impact on future generations, which is the main topic of tonight's talk. Before I welcome Ruth, I thought I would share some information about the concept of inherited trauma. Inherited trauma or transgenerational trauma is a psychological term which asserts that trauma can be transferred between generations. In other words, a child of a survivor could potentially be impacted by something that he or she never even experienced. Many of you may have also heard about the growing body of research that indicates that trauma can leave a chemical mark on a person's genes, which can then be passed down to future generations. Symptoms range from mild to severe and uh, then. So before Ruth and I start, I'm gonna just say that after our conversation, we'll have a little time for questions. So be sure to send your questions through the chat function, I believe to uh, Kimberly Bolero at the bottom of your screen. Now, please join me in welcoming Ruth Rotkowitz. Hello. Hi, Hi. Ruth. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I, I read your book. It was fascinating. It was interesting. It was, it was quite, quite the uh, engrossing read. And I thought that um, we could just have a little bit of a chat uh, about some of uh, the things that came up for me and perhaps for other readers in your book. Um, I wanted to start by asking you about the fact that you chose to write a novel about the child of survivors. And as a child of survivor yourself, what made you decide to go with fiction, maybe instead of a memoir or nonfiction? Well, uh, fiction to me is my most favorite form of writing, both for writing and for reading. Now, why I didn't write a memoir, first of all, my family story was already written up for the family. My sister and my cousin interviewed the, the, my parents and uncle, uh, wrote it up a few years ago. Then my niece redid it, did more questioning, put, put it with pictures. So we really have that already. Uh, and I find that with fiction, I had more freedom to control the plot line and the characters. I could bring in more um, issues that I cared about. Uh, I just had more control over the whole story. I have a problem with memoirs, uh, which does not mean there are not some very important memoirs out there. Certainly Holocaust memoirs are a way of keeping a record of what's happened. Um, but I find a problem with memoirs is the same problem I've seen when I was a teacher and you ask students to write something about a personal experience. People have trouble focusing. They can't differentiate between what's significant and what's not significant because it happened to you. You think everything that happened should go in there. You become obsessed with the accuracy of your details. And that is my problem with memoirs, even memoirs, professional memoirs that I've read. Um, I find they did not reveal anything really important. They were kind of rambling about a person's, you know, life and every single thing that happened. So I find that it's a very limiting um, medium. For me, what I was trying to do, I felt fiction gave me the freedom to do a lot of stuff with it. Thank you. I have to say that, that you, you certainly covered a lot of territory that maybe we'll talk about a little bit uh, further in the conversation. So tell me what inspired you to write this book? And if you want to get into more details, who inspired you to write this book? Well, I always was a writer. 
I've published, you know, short things, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, but I always felt I had a book in me. I had tried, started a few things and let them go. I felt it wasn't going anywhere. And then um, I was home with children. We were living in New Jersey. I come originally from Brooklyn. I'll answer that question now before people say, where in Brooklyn did you come from? Um, we had lived in New Jersey. I was home with a child and I felt stuck in my writing. And I saw an ad for a adult education course with a writer. She was a romance writer. So it was nothing that I would be interested in, but it was supposed to inspire you. I said, you know, what the hell, let me try this. I went to this class and um, she started off with this really hokey prompt, but amazingly it worked for me. She said, let's just imagine you're by a lake and you're fishing and you throw the fishing rod in and you pull out a fish and you say, oh, this fish is not for me and you throw it back. You keep going until you find a fish that so you go, aha, I, I think I can do something with this fish. So we all you know, closed our eyes and did the fishing expedition. And amazingly, my first fish said to me, uh, I am a troubled young woman. I'm leading a double life. I pretend to be normal and functional and efficient, but inside I have many fears and delusions and I'm trying to hide them from everybody. And um, of course I knew this woman has to be the child of Holocaust survivors because that's what I knew. I knew she would work in a large urban high school because that was my experience. And I went from there that this character came to me that, and, I, and I've observed so much when I see people who are always bragging about how perfect everything is in their family and in their lives. I just laugh inside like, sure, everything's perfect. Everyone's got something. And um, I just felt that was an important and interesting thing to explore how you could have, you can lead a double life. And what do you do about it when things, get worse and worse and you feel like you can't go on like that anymore. And that was my inspiration was that concept, that character. Thank you. And, and I wanna just also say, I don't know, Ruth and I talked earlier, I don't know how many people who are in the audience tonight have read the book. So we're gonna try not to do anything with re revolving around spoilers. Right. So right. in case you do wanna purchase it because it's definitely a, a good read. And, and so, yeah. um, uh, we'll talk. We'll talk around things a little bit and see where we go. But um, one of the things that I think was interesting for me too was your title, "Escaping the Whale," and I was trying to get a sense of how that fit into the story you just described and what is it about the title and its meaning for you. Well, somewhere in the back of my mind was the story of Jonah and the whale, the biblical story. I'm not sure why it. Uh, left an impress, such an impression on me. I always was interested in mythology and I think the idea of water, first of all, water is, is in every mythology. There is some important um, use for the story of water. Not only that water is life, which people knew even before they had the science to back it up, but water is a form of transportation, which it was in Jonah and the whale. He's trying to get away from God by going somewhere in the opposite direction on, on water. It's gonna take him away. Uh, I also put on my, on my website a lot of quotes about water from Carl Jung, uh, from Moby Dick, um, from other sources where the idea that water is kind of represents the unconscious. You don't know what's lurking underneath. You might see a smooth surface. You don't know what's going on below. Um, and the whale could also, from my readings in mythology, it could be a manifestation of uh, a dragon or sea monster that you see a lot of in pagan mythologies. So there was something elemental about the story. And it is such a bizarre story of being you know, swallowed by a whale, living in there for a few days, um, and then being spit out. For some reason that just left such an impression on me. It kind of has the feel of a legend. Uh, and I also felt that my character always wants to escape. She's not even sure what she wants to escape from, but something is always driving her. Something is scaring her and frightening her. And I felt the whale could represent all these fears and all her feeling of being trapped and, 
And um, I didn't really talk, I think in the book it's mentioned once the story and in the, I'm writing a prequel to it now, it's actually completed. Um, I, I go in again to the story a little bit. So I think the escaping the whale is kind of a symbol for her feeling of being trapped and feeling of wanting to be free. Okay, and I think that you, you certainly see that and she does some travels herself Yes. Thinking she might be able to escape from the stuff that's in her, but you you don't escape that. You know, you take that stuff with you. Right. Right. Well, like in the biblical story, Jonah thought he could get away from God, which you could interpret as getting away from himself by right. traveling, by going, literally going somewhere else. And in the book, I have the same thing. She feels if I go somewhere else, if I leave my job, my home, my boyfriend, whatever, I'll be OK because I'll be somewhere else. And of course, there's a lesson that you learn through that. For sure. So speaking about that, um, the, the concept of inherited trauma, uh, that clearly, there, there's so many directions I could go here because one of the thoughts I had is, you know, you also talk about, she has, a, she has siblings and it's not that each sibling's experience is different of from course. hers. And one, you know, one of whom doesn't seem to have been touched by anything that his parents experienced and another younger one, perhaps she's a little lost and confused, but what was it about inherited trauma, the concept for you that um, drew you to, to kind of want to talk about this in, in your book? Well, I'll tell you when I realized myself that I have some issues. Well, first of all, of course, we many of you are familiar with that famous book by Helen Epstein, Children of the Holocaust, which came out, I think, in the early 70s. And she really put a name, a label to that whole concept. Uh, people who had issues and were raised by survivors, they didn't know that it was common. And so I think that, you know, it, she gave us all the validation that, yes, this is real. This is a real issue and it can manifest itself in different ways. And a lot depends on the, the nature of the person. In my book, the main character is a very sensitive person. She's sensitive to everything, her environment, what's going on in the world. Other people are not that sensitive, so they might not be affected the same way. Also, even if you're raised in the same household, your lineup in the birth makes means that you're not really being raised the same way and parents react to children differently i you know i don't think you can assume that everyone's going to have the same you know problems or the same strengths um i think i first realized it myself when i started college in high school i remember that they would usually make you sit in a seat based on you know alphabetical order so wherever you end up was based on you know your last name and that was your seat in college, I remember walking into the rooms, except if it was like a big lecture hall, but just a regular classroom, and you could sit wherever you want. And I would immediately run to the back of the room near the back door. I felt like that's where I have to sit to feel safe. And I didn't pinpoint the reason for that till much later. I go like, safe from what? I said, well, maybe, you know, the Nazis are gonna come marching in through the hall and hold the whole class hostage or something will happen. Some horrible person will run in with guns or whatever. I can always get out because I'm near the back door in the back. Uh, and also I felt like no one could look at me. I was very self-conscious. I felt that you're sitting in the front or in the middle. If you're uncomfortable or you, you know, whatever, you're embarrassed by something that was said, everyone can see you. I'm sitting in the back, I'm looking at everyone else. I felt superior that way, I felt like I'm safe now. And I think I started to connect that with my um, family being Holocaust survivors at some point and say, you know, maybe this somehow relates, this feeling of I have to make sure I'm safe. And other people, since I've written this book and I put a number because of my own research and people I've spoken to, I became aware of many symptoms of inherited trauma, some that I've never even thought of. Um, on one of my blogs, in fact, I mentioned that a cousin of mine told me that she was always afraid of crowds. Now, a lot of people are afraid of crowds and you can you know, assign many reasons to that. You tell me yourself because you're short, you felt overwhelmed in a crowd. Um, I, I think I never liked crowds because I felt like, what if I can't get out? I have to go to the bathroom, but I can't get to the door. You know, you're, uh, you're, you're 
trapped in a situation. But this cousin said that her mother always told her that once her mother in Vienna was going home to her apartment and there was a, a Nazi rally on the, in front of the building. And she had to, with her own mother, she had to kind of pretend to be part of that group to get through them, to get to her door. So they would they were singing the Nazi songs and just pretending to be in this group. And she always said since then, she won't go to a rally, she won't go to anything because she's afraid of being stuck in a crowd. So that was a new one for me. And then I've had people tell me they're, they hate being in line. I had never thought of that as a problem. Um, some people are terrified when they have to line up, especially something where, like someone told me she was lined up with her child to go to school and they were checking, you know, I don't know what they were checking, your records, your name, your whatever. And they would send some people over there and some people over there. Well. You can imagine what that brought up to people like being lined up in a concentration camp, go to this door, go to this side. Um, an airport, someone told me she had a panic attack because they separated her husband from her because the TSA thing didn't, you know, stamp correctly. She had, she totally freaked out over that. So there are a lot of things. I know myself, I hate stripes, especially vertical stripes. I will not wear them, you know, on a top. Uh, boots. A lot of people want to wear black boots. Uh, so there are a lot of associations that may or may not connect to this, um, but it's a very interesting phenomenon and I just feel that it is real. Uh, and it's not just Holocaust survivors. You, I, I was on a podcast with a um, someone who runs a podcast about PTSD and this person had been a survivor of sexual assault. Now she was a young girl, she's single, but my feeling is that if a person doesn't deal with that kind of trauma, that's going to be passed on to the children too. Any kind of trauma can be passed on in some way if, you, if it hasn't really been addressed and acknowledged. Um, so I think it's a very real concern and there are a lot of people who are suffering from this. Thank you. You know, and, and you know, we can also, we can also talk about, you know, some of the things that occurred in her world your character, Marsha's world, that were also were, were additional trauma that that kind of I I use you know in my field we use the word trigger that may have been a trigger for some of of her her running away behavior and and some and the symptoms getting worse and worse you know there were two two pretty traumatic things that occurred at the school that appeared to have triggered her down downward spiral you know and I was going to say you know some of the things you were, it was interesting because some of the things you're talking about. I can resonate with as a child of a survivor. Um, I'd never heard about the stripes before, but I, but you know, but I can tell you that, you know, when I was, uh, I don't like being in enclosed places for too long. And it's and it's more about needing to know where the exit is and being able to get out. Yeah. And I think the other piece of this was, you know, always needing to have for me uh, and my family, we all need to have updated passports. And right. What is that about? But that's, that's just in the book, in fact, one yeah. of those quirks, you know, and is it connected to the fact that, you know, what happened to my family? I don't know. But it's certain when I talk to some people, they they don't feel that same pressure to mm -hmm. to have those things. And and I also, you know, we talked about when my husband and I were in Germany, which which was one week long trigger and um, being in the train was incredibly traumatizing and, and something that we didn't think, we didn't even think about would happen. And it just did all of a sudden we felt that way. We were in a hotel room and both of us without even consulting each other started looking for escape routes to make sure we could get out if we needed to be able to get out. You know, I thought that we were being locked in, I'm checking the locks on the doors. And so I think that your kid, you know, you, you create a character who I think has those quirks and then they kind of go even to a more extreme level. Yeah. So it, it was very interesting to see, as you said, when you write fiction, how you can kind of push things to a little bit more, you know, to, down the road a bit and push some barriers. Um, so, so I found that really intriguing. Now, um, I was gonna ask you, what made you decide to push her to, to that place? Well, I think there's a very, I'm not a psychologist, but I think there's a very fuzzy line between mental illness and normalcy. Um, and clearly this character I've created is in that area where she's getting closer and closer to a breakdown. 
And I think we need to realize that we're not so far away from mental illness. The people who have these serious emotional issues are not you know, aliens from outer space. They are dealing with real issues that we all deal with. And I think, I think by pushing her, I'm trying to show that this can happen. If you ignore it and you don't get help and you don't address your, your issues, your problems, it can escalate to the point of mental illness as I think she was, you know, nearing the abyss, so to speak. And, you know, I was hoping the reader would feel that with her, that things are getting worse and worse and she better stop. She better stop trying to run and hide and cover it up because it's not going to just go away. Um, and I think that I tried to make that point through this character that mental illness is not that far away and we all can be hovering near that borderline at times. I appreciated that. Well, as a psychologist, of course, what I I had to stop trying to diagnose her because that's what I kept doing. As <laughs> but um, the other piece of this is I th that I was appreciative of is I think that you touch on the issue of stigma. How is, now, we're, we're going to maybe we could talk a little bit more about the time frame you put it in because I think things are very different now than they were in 1980 where you where you set this book. But it was clear that at that place, you know, it, it was it, she felt embarrassed, and there were people who cared about her, who kind of viewed it, you know, weakness or whatever you want to call it, her, her significant other. And so I, I appreciated the fact that you, you address it in the, you know, this, the fact that, that this is something that should not be stigmatized, but you address the fact that the, the people viewed it that way. And on that note, I really am curious, your choice of time period, which was like kind of the spring, summer of 1980, what was the significance of that time period for you? Okay, I will answer that question, but before I forget, the fact that you mentioned stigma, I don't know if any of you watched the interview last night with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, and how when he was, when she told him that she was having suicidal thoughts, he didn't feel there was anyone in his family that would understand or help. Now this is today. And this is today. Yes, they're a different culture and they, they have to put on this big front, just like in a way Marsha felt she had to, but their whole being, their whole existence is based on this facade of perfection. So that in this day and age, he felt that he couldn't deal with that. He couldn't get her help in that environment. Um, as far as this spring, summer, 1980, I vividly remember that period. It made such an impression on me. Um, I was a little older than Marsha at that time, uh, but I remember that was the Iran hostage crisis when the hostages were taken at the embassy. And I'm not a TV watcher, but I would rush home every day and put on the TV like, what happened? What, does anything happen with them? I just kept thinking something terrible is going to happen. They're going to parade them out and shoot them in front of everybody. Something is going to happen. The crowd is cheering, you know, and again, that's my thing about crowds, how you get caught up in this fever and in, in this um, feeling that, you know, you have to all believe the same thing. I mean, we saw that the Capitol riots on January 6th, everyone's screaming and yelling the same thing. It becomes self-perpetuating. And I got very scared every time I would put on the TV, my heart would be pounding, like, what's going to happen to the hostages? What's, what are they doing? What, what do we not know? And I think a lot of Americans at that time, these people my age group, were horrified by it, even though they might know of other horrible things that have been happening in the world. But for some reason, this was the first time I think they saw the United States as vulnerable, that something can happen to Americans, something can happen to us. We're not safe anywhere, really. Anything can happen, even though we are the United States of America. And I think a lot of my generation took that issue very seriously of the hostage crisis because of, of what it represented in the world. Like maybe we're not so great anymore. Maybe we're so vulnerable now to some, you know, bunch of fanatics somewhere in the world. And I wonder if that contributed to Marsha's feeling of vulnerability as well, as well as, you know, the, you know, the message that we, you know, many survivors have said, you know, it can, it, it can happen anywhere. And so there was this sense that, oh my goodness, you know, these, these people are vulnerable too. And 
So, you know, I, I was wondering if that was something that also impacted her. Well, it goes both ways. I think she it, it impacted her and made her feel more afraid, but also the fact that it happened. Well, I'm not really saying this correctly. <laughs> Um, it made her feel more afraid, but it, it added to her feeling, but also because she was such a sensitive person, she reacted to it so strongly and mm -hmm. was so involved in it and so interested in it and so identified with, mm -hmm. with the hostages and their family. So it kind of went both ways. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, so having said that, um, gender definitely plays a role in this book as well. And again, I think placing it in the 1980s, uh, that was one of my, I, when I was reading the book, one of my thoughts, especially you, know, you have young girls in a high school, in an urban high school uh, with some unwanted pregnancies and the perspective of some people about, you know, it kind of, it's her fault, you know, she she did it, you know, and, and the, the judgment that went with that and, and also the sense that that Marsha was like the only woman in the guidance office. And so I think that they just, sh she can handle those, you know, because she's a woman. Uh, it, it just seems like it was a very strong role uh, in the book. And is that something that's kind of been uh, a theme in your in your writing experience? Is that something that you, you, you tend to like? I'll tell you my exposure to teenage pregnancy. Um, when I was teaching in New York, I taught in two summer sessions at this high school. Now, it was a boys high school, so we didn't have a pregnancy problem <laughs> during the year. However, for summer session, they, they brought in kids, kids could come from anywhere. And I remember one girl, tiny little girl, was huge. She must have been eight and a half months pregnant. And she was going to the summer school there. And she was marching through the halls with everyone else going to classes. And I remember sitting at a table with a couple of the other teachers and the male teachers were horrified and they were so nasty, not to her, to every, you know, talking about her. They were like, she shouldn't be here. Was she parading around like that? And, you know, what, she, how did she get into this mess anyway? Why is she think she going to go to summer school? The male teachers were horrible. And one of the women teachers said to me at one point, well, maybe if the school were more supportive in some ways, more girls would continue when when they're pregnant but the male teachers just had a terrible attitude and i put that in the book with that one teacher who was just very nasty called her a slut or whatever um they just felt like they could say whatever they wanted to to a girl um i mean the whole me too movement which is recent is the same idea they can say or do whatever you want you're just a woman you know and then when I moved to New Jersey, I did part-time work as a home instructor, which meant the high schools, there were two high schools in my district. If kids went on home instruction, their own teachers had the choice to go after school and tutor them. But if their teachers didn't want it, it went out to a pool of home instructors. So I became an English home instructor. And of course I had the usual broken leg and mono and kid getting kicked out of the school for selling drugs. But most of the kids I had were pregnant girls. I never found out if the school didn't want them to, you know, uh, continue or if they didn't want to continue. But um, uh, what I found out by going to these girls' homes, meeting their you know, families and tutoring them, there was no stereotype of a pregnant girl. There was a range. I had kids who were honor students, were going to go to college, top, top, top students. They got pregnant. Um, and there were kids who were, you know, had no interest in anything academic, who thought this child is the answer to their life. You know, their boyfriend's going to marry them and they'll live happily ever after and everything in between. So that was an education for me to see that there is no blueprint really for what makes a pregnant teenager and why they are carrying it through. And many of them were Catholic, okay, um, would not have abortions. I had one who was considering adoption, giving the child up for adoption, and her mother freaked out and said, this is my grandchild, you know, I'll help you, you know, you don't give it away. So I have had every kind of experience with pregnant girls, and it really was eye-opening to see that there were all types. You cannot stereotype the whole situation. You're right. You're right. And... Um, I appreciated that. I think that that also gives a perspective that, that the reader will find. Um, 
So I'm going to shift gears a little bit because uh, one of the things I know that people, uh, that, that certainly was a source of curiosity for me, was you didn't speak too much to her parents and their experience during the Holocaust and mostly her and her childhood and how she may have, you know, came to be the person she is. And I'm wondering what your thought was with about that. And, and um, well, in other talks I've given, people have asked me, they said, I want to know more about her background, uh, how she was raised, how, you know, she came to be this kind of person. And why don't you write a prequel? So that's what's coming in a few months. Hopefully I did do a prequel. Uh, I, I left it more that her background and the whole Holocaust is sort of the background. It's hovering over the story, but it's not part of the story. Mm -hmm. I didn't want that to be the story. It's not a Holocaust book in that sense. Um, it's not about what people went through only in passing it's mentioned to see how it affected her, how certain stories affected her. Um, you know, every survivor has a different story. In the book, I made the mother, you know, a Polish partisan. Uh, we knew people who, who had done that. My family came from Vienna. They were in the city. It's a whole different, you know, upbringing. So I think uh, I looked at the Holocaust more as the background not as the story itself. Although I was happy to hear from one reader who, very educated woman, not Jewish, I don't know what she knew of background. She called me after she read it and she said, I thought I knew about the Holocaust. I mean, we learned about it in school, but oh my God, I didn't know anything like what actually happened. And I really only mentioned a few little tidbits. I didn't go into anything. And to this educated modern day woman, it was a shock. So if they learned something about how horrible it was, fine, that, that's great. Although that wasn't my intention, it's in there. But you're right, I didn't go into too much background. I wanted that to be more, you know, behind the, behind the scenes. But as I say, there'll be more about it coming <laughs> eventually. Excellent. So in that vein then, so the, is the target audience mainly children of survivors? Who do you think that, 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 that the audience for this book is? Or well, that's interesting. When I wrote it, I really wasn't thinking about that. Then mm -hmm. when it was out, I felt, okay, who would care about this? Other children of survivors or other Jewish people? I have been very amazed and gratified to hear from uh, people who have no connection to the Holocaust or Judaism. I've heard from an Indian woman, from a Chinese woman. They said this was exactly what their experience was coming here with immigrants who were escaping a bad situation in their country and dealing with, you know, becoming educated in America where they want their children to be educated, to be assimilated that way, go to college, you know, have a career, but they don't want them to marry outside of their group, their their ethnic group. So there was the same kind of tug and pull of how much they want them to assimilate, how much they want to hold on to them. Um, and I think, I, as I say, I've had non-Jewish people tell me they relate to the period, to the, you know, that period of time. Uh, they relate to the situation in the school. They relate to her feeling of feeling, I have to get away. I have to find out who I am and, and not be so connected to my family. Um, I've just had people relate to so much in there, even if they were not Jewish or not not connected, not knowledgeable about that period. Um, young people uh, have said to me, I didn't even know about the Iran hostage crisis. To us, to my generation, how could you not know? That was, you know, a major event. But I mean, there are people who don't know about the Holocaust. So, it, you know, it, there's so much that people can get out of it other than what I thought the audience would be and what I thought they'd be looking for. Well, I think that that's true. So on that note then, so what do you feel is the message or the takeaway that, that people should or, or could get from, from, from your book? I would hope that the takeaway is to have compassion and empathy for people who suffer. And there's all kinds of ways to suffer. You can suffer physically, you can suffer psychically, emotionally, um, and it might manifest itself in a variety of ways. 
But I think what I hope people will come away with is that, you know, these are human beings and they need help. And if I can help them or steer them in the right direction, then that's the main thing. Um, if anyone is also interested in, you know, mythology, I think I have a lot of symbolism in there with water and animals. And uh, I think there's a lot we can learn from, from the ancient mythologies that, and that includes biblical stories that speak to human nature, that are eye-opening about human nature. But mainly my hope is that people will feel empathy and compassion for their fellow human. That's, um, that, that's a really, really nice way to, to kind of follow up on the message. Uh, because as I said earlier, I mean, you speak about um, suicide, you speak about uh, teen pregnancy, the marginalization of women. And um, I think that that is, again, one of my, my um, reactions when I was reading the book was, well, first of all, you know, I, I had to keep reminding myself of the decade, the, the era that it was placed in, because sometimes I would be horrified at the lack of empathy by people for for the things that had occurred um uh that you know because again as you described the me too movement etc you know i i feel that i was just stunned so i think that that's a it was it, it was a little disorienting i think for me as a reader until i i till i could kind of put myself completely in that era, which I too, what I remember about that is that that's when Nightline with Ted Koppel became a thing, was during the Iran hostage crisis. Oh. Uh, all of a sudden, that's when Ted Koppel became a big thing, and you watched him every night to get the update on what was going on with the Iranian hostages. And so, yeah, it, once I did that, and once I, you know, kind of could be in that place, I guess I could understand a little bit why, how people's attitudes were, but it still bothered me. And um, so I appreciate it. I think, I, was there an intention on your part? And I'll say it, for, for, for the reader to feel a little uncomfortable because there were times when I felt uncomfortable for these characters. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think especially, yes, of course, when she's imagining all these horrible things happening, that there were demons in her closet and you know all the, these fears um, which really people do have that. People do have uh, this fear that, you know, someone's in the apartment, I don't, I don't know where they're stealing my stuff. That, that makes for one type of discomfort. But I think the character of Marsha had a problem, which was, I, I think is more of a female problem, although it can be a male problem too, of establishing boundaries. She doesn't establish boundaries with the people in her life. And that's how she allows people at work, people who are supposed to be friends to take advantage of her or mess with her mind. And the boyfriend, especially, I can't tell you how many people said to me, I want to strangle him. <laughs> I wanted to slap his face. Um, you know, he's not a bad person, but he doesn't respect her boundaries. He, he thinks, and that I think is a dated attitude too, although not that it's completely gone. He's telling her how to live her life. He's telling her what to do and what to think and what to feel. And she lets it go on for a long time um, until she realizes that this is toxic. It's a toxic relationship. And I think women more than men, and again, I could be wrong, I think tend to get hooked into toxic relationships that they feel they can't break out of too easily. And I'm hoping that in the current day and with the you know, more discussion about that, that it's not as true as it used to be. I, I think so. I mean, I, I, I would even go so far as to say, I think in this day and age, the boyfriend would also be teetering on this kind of controlling, it wasn't abusive by any means, no. but certainly had that, you know, when you think about uh, being in an in, in a abusive relationship, it often starts with, you know, where were you? What were you doing? Why don't you want to be with me all the time? And, um, and so you, you, with the lens of today, you might even kind of view him somewhat as, you know, if she stays with him, she's going to kind of be not abused, but kind of he, he, he will be her world and that will be it. And so 
you know, you have to stay tuned and read it to find out if she does stay with him. But the pressure also from your family is, oh, he's a good catch, according to all the check thing, you know, check mark stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't find someone like that every day, you know, work with it, you, you know. Um, and it's interesting because whereas, as I said, most people were like, oh, thank God she got rid of him. And if my sister was on somewhere, my mother, who is almost 97, when she read the book, she said to me, um, too bad they couldn't work it out and she couldn't stay with him. <laughs> so to us, that was a generational uh, difference in the attitude that yes, he had all these good qualities. He had a good job. He was the right religion. He was the right this, the right that. She could have, you know, worked with it, and, you know. So nowadays, we don't have that attitude, especially if you're protecting yourself. As a woman, you're protecting your own boundaries and saying, you know, you can't come here because this is me. Correct. Over there is you, and, and we're not one and the same. So I'm hoping that that message got across that we have to respect ourselves. I, I hope so too. I, I can honestly say, I mean, it, it makes me laugh a little bit because I remember when I was getting my doctorate, uh, my parents were still very focused on, you know, that's nice, but when are you going to be get settled? When are you settled? Which was translated to find a nice Jewish boy, get married. You know, that doctorate's nice, but you know, when are you going to? And so I, you know, I don't know how many of you in the audience, you know, are of a certain generation where that was the, the case, that was the measure. But um, it certainly was the case in, in, in my home with, with my parents. So having said that, you know, the, I think that there, I believe that there are probably a number of, and I know many, many children of survivors who are in the audience tonight. And I'm wondering if there's any advice you could give them if some of them want to sit down and even, I know you, you talked about memoirs, but just what I, and I like that fishing metaphor what's a good, some good first steps for, for any of us two G's who are thinking about putting something down, whether it's fiction or non -fiction? Well, I think journaling is very valuable and very therapeutic. Mm -hmm. uh, some people do it in writing, some people do it in sketching and drawing. Um, I think it's a beginning way to confront what you're dealing with to address it, to acknowledge it. And that, and when I went on that PTSD web uh, podcast, that was really our conclusion that the only way to heal is to start off at least to acknowledge what you're going through. So that would be the first step, I think. Uh, and there are groups, I guess we can get together and share whatever journaling or artwork you, you want to share about it. Um, you can read about it as well, but I would be careful about what you read and not read things that are going to just make you feel worse. Um, you have to be ready for that. When I think about what memoirs and, and books about the Holocaust teach, show and teach, and I see all these people who are Jewish and you know, reading them, I say, well, we're not the ones that have to read it. It's all the people who don't know about it and who you know, don't believe it really happened. In fact, there was um, something came across, I forgot where I read this. Some guy from, I think he was from Iran, uh, he was brought up to believe that the Holocaust didn't happen. He, you know, grew up there and it was all a big lie. And then he went out of the country for something and he saw the movie Schindler's List. And he was like, oh my God, that he started doing research. And now he's outspoken about this really did happen. And they lied to us in school that it didn't happen. So, um, you know, I think the main thing is to, I mean, a lot of organizations are trying to get the, to, to educate the community about it, not just to like never forget for, for the survivors and their descendants, but to educate the people who may not have known anything. Um, I live in Arizona and I'm involved with the Phoenix Holocaust Association. And one of their missions, their main mission really is outreach to the community and with programs and book talks and exhibits and bringing in guests. Um, and to teach the community about this, what has happened. And I think that's very important. So getting involved with something like that might be another way, but I'd say, number one, you have to acknowledge it, whatever that takes. Write it down, draw a picture, or just know yourself that this happened. I think that your point is well taken. I, I, I don't know if, I think I shared this with you is that uh, when I was younger, uh, I was thinking I wanted to write my dissertation 
something about the impact of, of the Holocaust on children of survivors. And my advisor discouraged me for much, many of the reasons you're describing, because he, I think he knew me well enough to know that I really hadn't quite dealt with it, my own, you know, my own feelings about a lot of that. And that his concern was that I would just go down some rabbit hole uh, mm -hmm. and kind of like you described with the memoirs and, and would just kind of would get lost in it and, and wasn't really ready to write. Uh, to, I didn't have the distance or the detachment to be able to sit down and write a dissertation on that topic because at that time in my life, I, I really hadn't, I didn't journal. I didn't really, really wasn't on top of, you know, I didn't have PTSD, but there was certainly um, stuff related to my father's experience that I had not yet grappled with. So um, I think I hear, I hear what you're saying about the journaling and kind of if you're going to write something down, kind of yeah. be on top of your own stuff uh, yeah. or you, you, you take that on. So that, that does make sense. And, and not just, you know, if your parents are survivors, as you said, if, 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 you, if, you have it, if you have any kind of trauma in your life that you have any anything. And sometimes just knowing about it, and one of the talks I gave, one man said to me, I don't understand why this happened to me. He goes, I'm not a child of survivors. He was on going on some trip to Europe and his flight was rescheduled or whatever, canceled, and they put him on a Lufthansa flight. Right away, he's like, oh my God, I'm going on a Lufthansa flight. He gets on the plane, he is so attuned to like everything going on, the sounds, and he hears the doors close and the air starts coming up. And he's thinking, oh no, <laughs> the air must be the gas, you know, like in, uh, in the concentration camps and he started having a panic attack and I think he said his wife you know helped him calm down but it was just too the association was too close and he said I am not a child of survivors I said well you know enough about the stuff that happened that this affected you you know it doesn't have to be that you personally and some people say you know I'm suffering more than my parents and they're the ones that went through this it depends on the person's nature. If you take it on, if you absorb mm -hmm. all this pain, in a way it's worse because you have the guilt that you didn't go through it. So you feel like I have to live through it in my head because they lived through it actually. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot that goes on. And I think the first step is always to at least be honest and acknowledge it. Well, thanks. Um, uh, I'm wondering if uh, there are any questions from the audience that, um we uh, have okay two in the chat okay we do we do seem to have a few so um good evening everyone i'm so excited to be here with with you all today this has already been such an engaging conversation i've been on the edge of my seat the entire time um before i get to the question i do want to acknowledge all the women uh all the powerful women that we have on this call tonight as it is international women's day i think it's important that we uh recognize the incredible women that we all know love and work with um and just being here with a, a female author um, and our our female uh colleagues and uh and hosts um, it's such a wonderful, um, it's been such a, such an uplifting conversation already. So um, sending all of our love to our, all of our, our women in the audience tonight. Um, so Ruth, this has just been such an interesting conversation. Um, we do have a question uh, sent in about Marsha's background and childhood. Um, our audience member is wondering, did you create Marsha's background in childhood while you were writing the prequel, or did you have an idea about it while writing Escaping the Whale? So maybe you can tell us about the process of inventing yeah. this background. I didn't really think about the details of her background when I was writing this. I felt here was a fully completed young adult. She was 28 years old. She had a job, she had an apartment, she had a boyfriend. This was her life. Whatever came before or after is sort of hovering there in the background, but I didn't really think about details. 
I just knew somehow or other she knew about her family's experiences and it had affected her. And she was even uncomfortable talking to members of her family. She just didn't feel comfortable with them. She always felt on edge. And um, she wasn't comfortable in her own skin. I mean, that's my feeling that that's why that was happening. Um, but then when I was asked to write the prequel and I decided to try to do it, then I was first going into the details. And, um, you know, they say when, uh, when actors get a part in a script, they should imagine in their head the background of that character, even if it's not in the script, they should know the character's background because it will make them inhabit that character more fully. Uh, I think I knew enough that I could create her, but in doing the prequel, I thought of more details that I could put in that seemed logical, that seemed to make sense. Um, the prequel is going to be called The Whale Surfaces. So again, the whale is the symbol of her problems, her issues, her everything, and it first comes out of the water and she will begin to realize that she's she's got some issues to deal with, uh, even when she's young. So yes, uh, as I say, I knew some things, but not everything. Okay, thank you. And I think just the, the dimensions that you've, you've discussed about, about this character is just so, um, it's, it's such an engaging character, I think. Um, and uh, I think uh, this, this question of gender um, and the influence on your, on your writing and your, uh, your background experience, um, it's, it's truly remarkable what, what you've come up with, I think, with this, with this book and I think the prequel as well. Um, so I know you spoke, we did speak a little bit about, about gender itself. Um, what about, uh, we talked a little about siblings and, and the different reactions from that. Um, maybe you could, could you go a little bit more into that experience of, of how siblings kind of, uh, so internalize or not uh, this idea, this, this inherited trauma or, or even just from, from your writing experience? What is, what is this difference maybe in between uh, this question of gender and family? Um, well, in the prequel, the siblings have more of a part. Um, the sister Michelle is young. She's like seven years younger than Marsha. So at the beginning, you know, she's just a little kid, a cute little kid, an annoying little kid. And then a kid starts growing up and Marsha begins to see the difference between her and the sister. Um, the sister seems a little more uh, independent than she is. She seems more um, will, able to uh, deal with their situation better. Now, there's also an older brother, Elliot, who she visits in the book. Um, he has a family. In the prequel, he's an older brother, you know, he's in high school. Because he's a boy, they treat him with more um, leeway. He can get away with more, he doesn't have to answer for everything. Um, and I think that was a big issue in a lot of homes where, you know, they're more worried about the girl being safe but they feel the boy could, you know, do whatever he wants. And, um, you know, that can lead to a lot of other issues too. But in the prequel, I still, he had, she had a very good relationship with Elliot. He's very uh, caring for her, very paternalistic in a sense. And she admires him. Uh, the younger sister, when she's young, she's, you know, she's ignores her. Uh, until she gets a little older and can take her a little more seriously. But the middle child, Marsha, is the one who has the issues. I don't know if that's a typical middle child thing, um, but that's just the way it worked out in this particular family. And I think it's just a question of, of your nature. Uh, some people are gonna be scared of something and someone else is not gonna be scared of the same thing. It, you know. I mean, you could go on some dangerous hike, whatever, and someone will be scared to go over the waterfall and someone else is not scared. I just think a lot of it is the, the person's nature. 
Absolutely. Thank you. And being a middle child myself, <laughs> I can identify with some of those things. <laughs> Um, and so I think that's a, I think that's um, what also makes the story engaging is this relationship between family members. And I think I think that's something that all of us can identify with is um, you know, family relationships. You can read a book like this and say, oh, you know, I have I have a you know similar you know um, friction or or rapport with this with this relative. And so there is there is a lot of uh, there's a lot that we that you, you can do with that there. Well, we do have a question about um, if your if your reader should read the prequel before reading Escaping the Whale, or does it matter? Well, it doesn't matter really, but I would say to read Escaping the Whale first, because then the prequel will make more sense. I think. I, again, I I can't really say. I'm afraid if people read the prequel, they'll say, "Oh, I don't care about it anymore." After that, I'm done. <laughs> so um, I think. The prequel is very short. Uh, Escaping the Wheel was about 400 pages. The prequel, I think, is about 100. Um, so it, it doesn't really matter, but I still think Escaping the Wheel is the main feature. <laughs> um, and I do want to just tell you that it's available in four formats. It's in hardcover. It's in softcover, which is not a paperback because it's big, but it's a softcover. It's available in e uh, ebook for Kindle, and it's available on audio. So those are the four different, you know, formats for it. Um, also, you know, it's interesting, uh, we didn't bring up cutting, which is also called self-mutilation. That's something else that happens more frequently with girls than with boys. Um, I don't presume to know why maybe girls, when they're, you know, depressed or anxious, turn it, take it out on themselves more than, than boys would be more aggressive and take it out, outward. I think that's the general belief. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but that's the general belief. And I think, uh, I remember there was a big story about cutting uh, in the Times a couple of years ago and I remember how it's sort of coming out now that so many people do it. And sometimes you don't know, like they'll just wonder well, why is this person always wearing long sleeves, pulling them down, you know, over their wrists. And I think that the psychology behind it to kind of relieve psychic pain by creating a physical pain for yourself um, needs to be understood, especially since uh, it can happen to older people too. It's not just teenagers. Very often it starts in the teenage years, but you know, I just think all these issues that come up, suicide and pregnancy, cutting, all these lovely things in this book, um, I think require us to step back and take a fresh look at them and not be judgmental. We're so used to being judgmental and having an opinion about everything um, that sometimes we just have to stop, you know, and say, I don't know about this. And you know, I have no opinion yet because I don't know. And I think that's one of the issues that require that kind of reaction. Well, thank you, Ruth. Uh, you know, I, I, I had, I, there, there was, I'm gonna leave you with this before we uh, close up the program. Uh, thank you, first of all. Uh, and I hope that uh, everybody here who hasn't read this book will, will take the opportunity to read Escaping the Whale. And I think there's a book in here, somewhere there's a book in here about the male perspective, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. So I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave the men out. Uh, my husband who can't see, asked me. Important. So um, anyway, I just want to um, say that uh, I hope everybody can join me in thanking Ruth for her time tonight and her insights into this fascinating topic. Ruth, thank you for joining us again, and everyone in our audience, thank you for being here. Uh, you can learn more about Ruth's work and her book, Escaping the Whale, by visiting her website. I believe it's Ruth's Whale, but it will be in the chat. Um, we, we will also provide a link for you to purchase the book as well. If you liked tonight's program and want to see more from us, consider making a donation at www.ctvoicesofhope.org. Uh, use our text to give number, and you can even find us on Venmo. We're just so 21st century. All of the ways to donate tonight are listed in the chat box. And before you go, next Monday, March 15th at 7 p.m., we're, we're welcoming Esther Safran Foyer,
who will speak to us about her book, I Want You to Know We're Still Here, a finalist for the Jewish Book Award. It is the true story of her journey to learn about her father's experience during the Holocaust. Her son, Jonathan Safran Foyer, penned the fictionalized account of his grandfather's journey in his novel, Everything is Illuminated, now a motion picture. Yeah. It will be another remarkable conversation, so be sure to register at the link. It'll also be in the chat. All of our upcoming speakers are listed on our website, ctvoicesofhope.org. While you're there, check out all of Voices of Hope's educational and commemorative programs and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates and much more. And Ruth, thank you again. And everybody, thank you again for joining us tonight. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs>